Okay, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. My name is uh, Sarah Prey, and on behalf of the Open Society Foundations and the FACT Coalition, I'd like to welcome you this morning. Um, as you likely noted, the event is being filmed um, by C-SPAN. It's being live webcast and also filmed for Book TV. Um, so for those of you that don't know, the Open Society Foundations is a global grant-making and advocacy organization focused on good governance and human rights. The FACT Coalition, which was just launched this week, is the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency Coalition. And it promotes greater accountability and transparency within financial institutions, corporations, and governments. So the FACT Coalition focuses on closing tax loopholes, requiring <coughs> business ownership information, strengthening anti-money laundering laws, and making corporate tax contributions more transparent. So allow me to just, just briefly outline the problem that uh, Rebecca and Nicholas are going to discuss today. Uh, the Senate uh, Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations estimated in 2008 that the U.S. lost $100 billion <coughs> in tax revenue due to offshore tax abuse, and that's every year. The Citizens for Tax Justice estimates that U.S. companies are housing $1.2 trillion of unrepatriated foreign profits offshore, and that means that the U.S. lost $400 billion in estimated tax revenue on these profits. <laughs> I mean, that, that's pretty staggering. But why should we care? The first reason we should care about this issue comes, I think, from a place of fairness. You might have seen on Jon Stewart recently that not only did General Electric not pay any income tax <coughs> in the past three years, they actually got a $3 billion tax credit. So in this current uh, political and economic climate of slashing budgets, and austerity rhetoric, this offends the logical mind. And of course, GE is not alone. The news media is beginning to report about how US-based multinational companies like Transocean, Xerox, Pfizer, and others benefit from the offshore financial system and contribute <coughs> as little as possible to the government of the United States. One of the other main reasons that the Open Society Foundations and the FACT Coalition cares so much about this is because of the exceptionally deleterious effect that it has on developing countries. The Global Financial Integrity, the organization Global Financial Integrity estimates that between 2000 and 2008, $810 billion <coughs> of illicit funds flowed out of developing countries. And in the opening chapter of Treasure Islands, Nick talks about how this scenario plays out in Gabon, an oil-rich but dirt-poor country in Central Africa, and the negative impact that it has on the population. The wealth stays in the hands of the powerful elite while the rest suffer. And as Nick says, this story is hardly unique, and he's seen it in many other resource-rich but poor countries. With that, I'd like to introduce our panelists. First, Nick Shackson, author of Treasure Islands, Uncovering the Damage of Offshore Banking and Tax Havens. The book is for sale outside uh, the room. Nick's a British writer, journalist, and investigator, and the author of the acclaimed 2007 book, Poisoned Wells, The Dirty Politics of African Oil. He's an associate fellow of Chatham House and a writer and researcher for the Tax Justice Network, an expert-led group focused on tax and tax havens. Since 1993, he has written extensively on global business and politics for the Financial Times, Reuters, The Economist, and its sister publication, The Economist Intelligence Unit, among many others. Treasure Islands, which he will discuss today, takes us through the very colorful and often very seedy world uh, uh, the, the, that created what we now refer to as the offshore banking world. One theme running through the book <laughs> is that the offshore financial system was created in a manner that uh, deliberately avoided political oversight at almost every turn. And it is critical that our democratically <coughs> elected leaders take a good, hard look at it and how it functions now. Rebecca Wilkins is Senior Counsel on Federal Tax Policy at Citizens for Tax Justice, a nonprofit organization that has been working for a fair and sustainable tax system for more than 30 years. Rebecca was a CPA for 20 years, specializing in tax at KPMG and her own accounting firm. Uh, Rebecca understands inside and out how the offshore financial system lets companies and wealthy individuals shirk paying the taxes that the rest of us have to pay in order to keep this country running. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to Nick Shackson. Um, and thank you again once for coming. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. 
I want to really make three main points today. Uh, first is that the offshore system of uh, tax havens is much bigger and much more important, much more central to the global economy than almost anybody knows. I think the figures of $100 billion of lost taxes is very important to the United States, but I will argue that the damage is much, much greater than that. There are all sorts of different areas, not just in the area of tax, where the U.S. and developing countries are harmed by this system. I will also make the point that you cannot really understand this without understanding that there is a connection. There is, I mentioned, and Sarah mentioned, the, the connections between the United States uh, and the developing countries. The offshore system connects the two in, in very unusual and surprising ways. And we need to reconsider what tax havens are and where they are. Uh, most people think of them as small palm-fringed islands in the Caribbean, but uh, I, I will argue that they are much, the system is much bigger and much more important than that, with some very surprising results of where the biggest tax havens in the world are. The third element I want to touch on is that tax havens were very fundamentally part of the root cause of the latest global financial crisis and the ensuing economic crisis. Those are my three main points for today. But I want to start telling a little bit of a story uh, which Sarah touched on that, that comes from the beginning of Treasure Islands, my new book. When I was in, I, I went to Gabon many years ago, 1996, 1997, and I wanted to research what was going on in this strange little African country. It was an oil producer, small population, quite rich, uh, run by uh, what was, who, who became for many years my favorite dictator, Omar Bongo. Uh, favorite in the sense that he was, uh, I think, perhaps one of the smartest uh, rulers that I've ever come across. Now, as I prepared to go to Gabon, I received a telephone call from someone in Paris I'd never heard of saying, I hear you're going to Gabon, and we'd like to help you. And I was a little bit nonplussed, but being a journalist, I thought, well, of course, this is interesting. I'll, I'll see what he has to say. Uh, and he said, uh, you know, when you arrive, give me a call. And it turns out when I arrived that he and an assistant had flown out from Paris, first-class Air France tickets, uh, and their mission was to look after me and to make sure that I spoke to the right people and spoke to them in the right way. And his, his job was to fill up my calendar, essentially, is what I, what I later discovered. What I didn't know then, I had actually stumbled into something that later became known as the Elf Affair, which was something uncovered by some investigative magistrates in Paris and turned out to be the, uh, the biggest corruption investigation in European post-war history. And I had arrived in Gabon at a very sensitive time. Now, why was Gabon significant? Essentially, Elf Aquitaine was the French state-owned oil company. And they had created a system that connected up the political elites of France with the political elites of Gabon in a giant system of corruption. And what they wanted was a system of financing that was not happening in France that was overseas, in a sense, offshore. And they would do it using African oil, specifically using African oil. Not just African oil, but, but that was kind of the linchpin of it. And so you had a secret financing system that was used for financing political parties, both on the right and the left, in France. And this financing system, was that the money was flowing out of Elf Gabon and other oil-rich African countries where ELF had operations, ELF Congo, ELF Angola. It was a giant offshore slush fund, and it's only thanks to the persistence of one magistrate in particular in the beginning, Eva Jolie, that this system was ever uncovered. It was kind of an open secret uh, among the uh, French elites that there was this system, but nobody had ever really brought it up to the, to, to the light of day. And this was used for paying bribes on behalf of French companies trying to win contracts. The corruption spread around the world. There was uh, the magistrates uncovered huge deals in Venezuela, in Taiwan, in Germany, all over the place. I, I began to realize that I think we'd always seen the problem of corruption in Africa as an African thing. And when people analyze corruption, 
they look at each individual country and, and, and say, you know, Nigeria.